Notice the journeys. Notice the struggles. Notice the success. Notice that we are much more than just athletes. You've heard the stories, but not quite like this. New episodes weekly on Thursday. It's time for the world to take notice. Take notice. I'm your host, Dwayne Notice. We got a very special guest. We got someone that I admire, someone I've known for a while. When I was in high school, I remember her killing stuff in basketball when she was in the Guelph area. Um, but we got someone that I'm very excited to talk to today, Nadia Shanwa. What's up? Hey, hey, thanks for having me. No problem. So right now, um, we're going to do the warm-up. Ah, so let's just talk about your, your background. I know you were born in Toronto, but for some reason, I have this memory of you just being like Hamilton and Guelph's just go. <laughs> so do you want to talk about your transition from Toronto to Guelph? Yeah, so growing up, I lived a little bit all over. So, like, even when I'm here, people ask me, like, where are you from? And I'm like, I claim the whole province. Like, I'm from Ontario, period. <laughs> like, and plus, they don't know, you know, in the States, they never really know exactly what you're talking about anyways. But I was born in Toronto, but I um, spent most of my time in Guelph uh, in middle school. And then when I went to the NIDA program, that's when I was in Hamilton. So I did my high school uh, years in Hamilton at St. Mary's um, and then on and off with the NIDA program. So I was training there. Let's talk about the NIDA program. I remember that the first kind of introduction to that, I kind of felt like a prep school where it was like a basketball academy. I know like Bill Crothers and other schools kind of followed suit. And now we have a whole bunch of prep schools in Canada, like Orangeville Prep, et cetera. Talk about you being one of the first people to go to a specific sports training type of facility where you guys focus on basketball a lot. Like what was that like being there, just being away from home um, in the sense that you weren't at home at home and going to school out there? Yeah, these, these young kids are spoiled these days. They got prep school leagues. I know they got the Jew League. They got all the leagues. But when, when I was younger, um, back in the day, <laughs> people don't even know what Nita was anymore. It's like the OG prep school. But, yeah, it was basically the same format. Um, I moved away. We actually lived and built it with families, though. So I think that's the difference. I think the players nowadays live together. But So I lived with a couple different families uh, while I lived in Hamilton. For, fortunately enough for me, it was only 45 minute drive. So like I was still close enough from my family, but some of my teammates came from different provinces. And so they lived there and it was almost like a university setting at a young age. So it was tough, um, especially because the initial intention of the program was supposed to be for 11th and 12th grade, but I actually went in the 10th grade. So I was the youngest player to be playing with that group uh, my first year. So I was just really lucky that the girls that I played with at that time um, are still people that I'm friends with to these days. So it really took me under their wing and, and made me feel like uh, I was still at home, even though I wasn't with my family. Yeah, that's amazing. So we're going to talk about you just being in the States playing basketball at a high level. I know me personally growing up, we had the Raptors sort of that was on TV. But we didn't, they weren't really showing WNBA games. They weren't really showing NCAA games. Like, I remember going to college, University of South Carolina, and I was getting made fun of because I didn't know, like, schools outside of Duke in North Carolina. But that's all I knew from movies. So they didn't really broadcast that kind of stuff when we were in Canada growing up. So what was your main factor influence for wanting to play basketball? That's the craziest thing. And I talk about it all the time. Now there's some partnerships where the WNBA games are on TV, but – I mean, the only reason I really knew anything about basketball was because of the Raptors, because my older brother was a big fan. I remember having a Carter jersey. That was probably the extent to my basketball knowledge growing up because we didn't really have that professional level or that high level available to us. So I was fortunate enough that I played on national teams really young because that's how I got my influence on how to be a pro or how to even to know what it was to be a pro or that it was a possibility to play overseas possibility to play in the WNBA I wouldn't have known that without that so I actually started playing basketball originally by accident because I had a growth spurt and um, my dad's Nigerian so you know I was playing soccer like we we're all full football we were all playing football from a young age and then um, I had a growth spurt my coach was like yo you're kind of tall you should try to play basketball so I tried I was trash <laughs> I was so bad I was so bad I was so bad but I kind of stuck with it. I love the team atmosphere of team sport and playing basketball. And it's opened some big doors for me. So I wouldn't trade it for anything. Okay, that's cool. So talking about your background, you're saying your dad's Nigerian. Um, where's your mom from? I know you have a sister as well. You talked about your older brother. Um, are you like very family oriented? 
Yeah, um, my family means everything to me. So I have a younger sister and an older brother. My sister's birthday is uh, this month. My brother's birthday is this month too. So September is a big month for my family. <laughs> um, but my, uh, yeah, my dad's Nigerian. My mom's family background is German. Um, but like I grew up in Canada and I live in the US. I mean, I've lived all over. Um, but I've been really uh, blessed to have a family that supports me. Um, they come all over. Like my dad was in China the year before. I lived in, with my sister for a little bit in South Korea while I was playing there. She was teaching there. So um, I, they really rode, rode for me. And, and I'm really, really just so fortunate that they support me in everything that I do. That's amazing. It's always good to have a test. You know, when they support you, give you that admiration, that inspiration, and you can always go far with it. How did you get noticed, uh, no pun intended, um, <laughs> with, because I'm not really sure how it works. How did, how did you get the recruitment process down to end up going to the States? I know for me growing up, again, I was kind of in the same era as you as where exposure, it was really hard. Like coaches weren't really coming across the border to watch us play unless you were like an Andrew Wiggins or whatever. But even then he was still going to the States to play basketball at prep school. So just talk about your recruitment process for any young women out there who are playing basketball and they, they want to take it to the next level like you have. Yeah, I mean, they're so fortunate nowadays to just have the visibility and to have tournaments that go on both sides of the border. Uh, the reason why I kind of got into the recruitment process was playing with Team Ontario and then also playing with the junior national team. We played a couple tournaments in the U.S. Um, also, when I was with Nita, we played a couple of JUCOs in the U.S. too. So that kind of got my name in the pot. And then from there, it was just um, team started to contact me. Coach McGraw actually came to Canada to watch us one time. Um, and uh, the reason why I actually got recruited to Notre Dame was I was playing with the U.S. I was playing against the U.S. in Argentina with the junior national team. And Neil Ivey, who's now the head coach of Notre Dame, was there to watch Skylar. <laughs> so she was there to watch Skylar. And then she's like, she always tells the story. And she was like, then I had to call up Coach McGraw and was like, yo, there's this Canadian chick. <laughs> like, we got a recruiter. <laughs> and then kind of the rest is like history from there. Yeah, awesome. So we're going to take a break right now. It's halftime. Um, go back into locker room. We're going to play Notice My Steez. Notice My Steez essentially is just a game where we just get to know you better behind just the, the woman you are on the basketball court. All right, so first one, favorite dish of all time? Cajun seafood boy, like the crab legs, the corn, the potatoes, all of that. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, what's the, uh, the Nigerian dish? The I know, I, like some agusi or some okra, something like that. I know I was thinking about it, but right now that's my thing. The crab legs is my thing right now. All time, yeah, I might have to put some fufu in there, but uh, my dad's going to be like, how dare you? <laughs> Artist of all time. All time? Mm. And then you could do right now as well. Yeah, I'm listening to a lot of like Tiana Taylor right now, um, some Summer Walker right now. I'm like really like chill, like R&B vibes, but like all time, like I like I got Beyonce's on all time, Drake's on all time. What's your favorite hobby? Cooking, baking. 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 I really I'm about to make some banana pudding, <laughs> like, like anything, desserts. And I don't even like desserts like that. Like okay. I really, I like, other people enjoying stuff. So I like to cook for other people. I like to bake for other people. Favorite movie of all time and then favorite movie recently I, that you like? Ooh. All, I mean, I got to go with like Love and Basketball. That's going to be the cliche of any basketball hooper dream, Love and Basketball dream. Um, but really, I just rewatched Black Panther too with everything in which have been passing. So um, that, that's definitely an all time great. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sidebar, would you, is <laughs> cliche aside, is that, have you done that before? Like, have you played one on one with a nah, guy? I mean, I have, but like, not, not, like, I would never play my boyfriend in one on one, first of all. Yeah. <laughs> first of all, <laughs> we can't play card games. We can't play board games. Like, we can't play certain things in the house because the competition is just, it's too heavy. And like, like, we ain't trying to break up relationships over one on one. <laughs> Favorite holiday. Favorite holiday, um, Christmas, for sure, Christmas. Yeah, I love the, the opportunity to be together with my family. And then and now, like, I'm not playing overseas as much anymore, but before it used to be, like, the only break or holiday that you get to really most of the time come home for, except when I played in Asia where they didn't necessarily celebrate it, so I didn't get to come home for that. But um, even when you're in college, it's, like, really the only holiday that you get time to spend with your family, so that was important for me. Favorite TV show? 
tough. Grey's Anatomy is an all-time favorite. I just finished watching Power. I know I'm late, but I just finished watching it. <laughs> yeah, those are some good ones. Hey, that's better late than never. I know, right? <laughs> Notice your steez. That's done. Halftime is over. Back onto the third quarter. Talk about your experience at Notre Dame. How was it being a freshman stepping onto campus? A, di a different atmosphere being in the States. Um, like you said, being in Indiana your whole life. But just being someone that was in Toronto in the GTA and then going to the United States, what was the biggest difference culturally that you noticed? And then also just talk about you being a freshman there. And was it like loving basketball, Monica? You get there, you had like a mean senior. Yeah, when I went to Notre Dame, um, I was really not shocked, but it was definitely a little bit of an eye opener. Just, I already went to Nita and was kind of living on my own in a sense, but like having the full independence of being an, an adult, at college and, and having to um, take care of your own stuff. I was really fortunate to go to Notre Dame because they had so many resources available to us, like from nutritionists to academic advisors to like our strength program. So I really had a lot uh, of help, um, but I think just being on your own and being that far away from home for an extended period of time, that was really my first time. So uh, fortunately, like I said earlier, my family, there were some ride or dies. So they were up there for like every home game. It's like a six and a half hour drive, but they were up there all the time. Yeah. So I was really just fortunate to have them still be a part of my career while I was at Notre Dame. Um, but I mean, we went to four final fours, like we were competing. Um, and it was, it was tough though. It was tough to get used to a, a rigorous schedule of having to balance um, that high of a competition level and then still like, do well in school um, and still have somewhat of a social life and still stay connected with people. Um, but it was, it was worth it. It was all worth it for sure. I mean, I wouldn't, that was the first decision that I really made by myself. Like, I mean, you know, you make little decisions and choices all the time, but like that was the first major life changing decision that like my parents were like, yo, it's up to you. You got to live with your choice. So make, the best one that you can. And that's one that I, was, I will take to the grave with me. That was one of the greatest decisions that I've made um, because of the connections that I make made while I was there. Some of my best friends I played with at Notre Dame and, or I met at Notre Dame and like it, the connections from the alumni clubs, like people that are still hit me up like, Hey, I'm a Notre Dame alum from class of 65. Like, and I'm like, it's just endless, endless, endless supply of connections and, and relationships. So I uh, still, Always rock my Irish. <laughs> I understand exactly what you mean. Um, going to university, same thing with us. I mean, I was only fortunate to go to the Final Four once in my senior year. But yeah. just having that, you know, you run into different people every time when I'm in the South. It's just like, yeah, I'm class of, I'm class of seventy two. I'm class of sixty five, and I never thought, you know, you guys would take it that far. And I, you know, just having that recognition from people to kind of provide that, I guess, hope and uh, provide that, that that happiness for them, just being a part of the institution. Um, as well as talking about balancing school and talking about playing at a high level. I think that's something that's very underrated. And a lot of people, we'll get into it when we talk about your professional career, but a lot of people think that basketball players and athletes are just like commodities and they don't understand that we're also people. And I'm, I'm glad that mental health is starting to be talked about more and more and more because mental health doesn't necessarily just mean depression, anxiety, and all that stuff. It also means what you're talking about, just being able to balance the different aspects of your life and also deal with people critiquing you. I know you probably have people critiquing you a lot. I had people Twitter after a bad game and saying, everything. and we're still kids. We're just young kids just playing a child's game and we're not even getting paid for it yet. You know, we're not professional yeah. working on our craft. So um, it's cool for you to speak out about that. Um, so at Notre Dame, you also went through an injury where you tore your ACL and it was unfortunately your last home game. And I think you guys were in the tournament. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so it was the Elite Eight game of my senior year. Uh, it was about like five minutes left in the game. I blew out my whole knee. I was going in for a layup and just, I could feel it. And when I fell, I knew I did it. And I knew it was over at that point. So I actually kind of got up, gave my team a little rally cry might have been a little bleeped out on ESPN, but <laughs> I knew that my moment was done. I knew that my moment on the court was done. So I was just trying to like give my team some inspiration and some motivation. Like, don't think about me. We need to win this game. A lot of highs and a lot of success in going to four and final fours, but um, fortunately never won one. Uh, won a championship, national championship while I was there. 
Um, that was always a dream of mine. So that was the hardest part, I think, is just realizing that the chance was done, like the opportunity was done. Um, no more eligibility left, no more second shot. Um, and that was the hardest part and kind of realizing that, that I wouldn't be able to be there on the court with my team. But I still went to the Final Four, still went to the championship, sat on the bench, tried to coach and try to help my teammates any way that I could because um, I've always been like a smart player. I've always been an intellectual player. So just trying to help them from the bench any way that I could. But injury sucks. Yeah. It's it's, part of I mean, you already know, like you're going through it now, but it, it's the worst. It's the worst part of athletics is that um, how much, like, of course, we depend on our bodies to be healthy, to be able to play, to do our job. And I think that's like also a piece that people don't really realize is that now, and especially at a professional level, everyone goes to their job, they go to their nine to five. I can't turn off my job. I live, I literally live my job. Like people are like, oh, you get, a, you get off days. I'm like, yeah, my off day, I'm, I'm doing recovery or I'm doing rehab. Like we're here in this bubble and we're playing literally every other day. So it's like, oh, you have a day in between. And I'm like, well, I got to practice. I got to do treatment. I got to get in the pool and do recovery. It's like, I can't even just be like, oh, one day I want to go out and drink. I'm like, well, do I practice the next day? I <laughs> can't just fly and go on a last minute trip. Like, what's my schedule? Like, can I train? They got a gym. It's like, I, that's, that's the part that I don't think um, people really truly understand or appreciate is that athletes literally live their occupation. Yeah. It, like you said, being a professional, it covers a whole bunch of bases. You got to be professional 24 seven, which is different from, like you said, other occupations. But with us, we got to be professional all the time when no one's looking. It's very, it's very hard. It's, it's very difficult. And um, I think not a lot of people understand that. But I think it's a testament to your leadership for the fact that you came out and were still able to coach despite having the ACL tear. And then just you being a selfless person. I know you personally, so I know like you're a very caring person and you're an amazing individual. But the fact that you're able to come out and tell your team, like, don't worry about me. Like, let's focus on getting this win and get to the championship game was, I think, was very, was very dope. Let's just talk about the mental aspect of your injury. I know I don't really want to touch on it too much. I'm going through it as well with a torn Achilles. But let's just talk about where you were in your mindset because you being a senior, that's pretty tough. Like, you're on track to – I'm assuming you wanted to play professionally. So having that happen so late in your college career, where was your mindset and how did you overcome and push through? So with the timing of the way the WNBA draft two works, it's like pretty much like right after the tournament. So – toying with like the emotions of the injury and kind of just being in shock about that. I also was trying to think about like, okay, what's next? I entered the WNBA draft prior to my injury. I actually got invited to attend the WNBA draft. And so after I got hurt, I called up our, our VP at that time was like, Hey, like, I don't know if I, if I want to come, I, I didn't want to be everyone else name get called and, I'm sitting in the room still, like, cause I didn't get drafted. And I felt like where I was emotionally and mentally, I couldn't deal with that on top of it. So I called her and I was like, I, I don't know if I want to come. And she actually kind of persuaded me to come. She said, don't think about it that way. I remember her telling me that your invitation and your attendance in the draft is a tribute to the work that you've put in these past four years to get where you are. So think about it as a celebration of, your career and don't worry about the injury and like let it work itself out. And that stuck with me. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go through it for the experience because it's not just the draft. Like we did um, some media training. Um, there was a nutritionist there that went through some food stuff. We did some financial training stuff. So it was a whole weekend. And so I was really glad that I did go. Um, Cause I still got drafted. So I got picked ninth overall by the Indiana fever. So I wasn't still sitting in the room. Um, and my family got to be there once again. Like my parents were there and I was just got to hear my name being called and, and limp up the stage. I, <laughs> I was so like distracted the moment, like we had done a walkthrough earlier and I didn't want to use my crutches. So my crutches were actually under the table that I was sitting at with my family. And we did a walkthrough because I couldn't bend my knee properly. So I had to walk up the stairs a certain way. But when they called my name, I forgot and I almost fell off the stairs <laughs> trying to get up the damn thing. <laughs> oh, but it was, it was once again, it was great. It was amazing opportunity to be able to have my name called and Indiana take a chance on me because I was I had to sit out that first year so that played off obviously because you're still with the fever and you're still doing big things so now you guys are in the bubble um do you just want to tell everybody where the bubble is right now I know it's located in Florida as well and how your experience has been playing in the bubble yeah so 
what we're calling like the wobble, the WNBA bubble. Uh, it's in Bradenton, Florida at IMG Academy. So uh, it's actually where I live. It's like a apartment style villa. I live with one of my other teammates um, and we train and practice here. And then we have to actually drive outside the bubble zone um, to go play our games at Feld. So uh, there's two courts in there. It's kind of crazy to not even have like bleachers, like it's literally like curtained off, which I actually think is kind of cool because the graphics and the way they've been able to put up the teams and put up the WNBA logo, put the Black Lives Matter on the court, um, the aesthetics of it, and it's really nice for TV. So they really, they really worked in a short period of time in a crisis in trying to put this bubble together. And there's been some hiccups, but I think the league and um, our Players Association have worked really hard on making it kind of the best experience in the moment. Um, and also giving us the opportunity as players to still use our voices and to still um, be able to uh, stand in solidarity in our messaging um, that we are a league of, of strong black women majority. So um, just being able to be in the face and have time on TV and for little girls all over the world to see us in this moment has been huge. Yeah, just touching on that. First of all, you're amazing Black Lives Matter shirt. But <laughs> the Wubble also follows suit and, you know, boycotted, um, I don't know, was it for a day or two days last week? Yeah, so, it, well, actually, it, it wasn't a boycott. So, originally in the first day um, when the Bucks and the NBA decided that they were going to play any sports games that day, um, us as uh, the Washington Mystics led us. And um, as a players association, we, we met and decided that first day that we were gonna stand in solidarity with our NBA brothers and in, in not play games that day. And then the way our schedule works in, in the bubble is that we're playing like half teams play on one day, the other half plays on the other day. So the second day we actually decided that we were gonna take um, kind of just a, a day of rest, a mental health day a day for all teams to kind of take a second and breathe. Um, like we touched on earlier, it's a reminder that as athletes, like we're people too. Uh, yeah. Like that jersey is a piece of clothing. Like when I take it off, I'm still a person. I'm still a black woman. So with everything that's going on in, not only in the U.S., but everywhere, um, the tension and, um, the stress, it was time for us to just take a second, take a break, take a pause, to take a breath, and then continue on our focus and the reason why we're here. I mean, the WNBA has always been about it. We've, we've always been about pushing the message. We've all, always been about education. We've always been about voting, and we've always been about spreading the message. So for us, nothing changed. It just kind of, we needed a second to take a breath and then continue on that mission. I went to South Carolina, so, you know, it was the South-South. Mm -hmm. um, I think they like the Confederation flag that I've never seen before, just being a kid from Toronto. Um, you know, going to the South, I didn't really see a lot of other cultures. Just, it's like white or black, mainly, predominantly. And it, even me joking with my teammates, and they're asking where I'm from, and I'm saying I'm Jamaican. They're like, like they don't understand the concept of why or how would Jamaicans even come to Canada? Why would they? Or, like, the fact that my neighbors are Italian and my someone else is this and that. So you just being, you know, like you said, Nigerian and German, did you see or feel any of that kind of when you went to Indiana or sorry, when you went to Notre Dame? Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. It's like typically when I've asked um, people that are mixed race or people that are black here, because back home, anytime you see someone, you're light skin, you're like, what, what do you mix with? And everyone's literally like, because they're either first generation or maybe second generation immigrants. And so everyone kind of knows where they came from. You have this multicultural community in Canada where um, our cultures are celebrated. And I think that was the difference is that growing up, I knew people from different backgrounds and it, it made me more um, sensitive to it. It made me more educated on it. And I think that was the difference when I went to came to the US and it was I kind of like kept that same mentality like oh where are you from and it's like I'm, I'm black or I'm African-American and um, I think that the missing heritage is was the difference who so far in your career was I want to say the best or hardest person player that you had to guard or go up against man my first couple years okay 
little background here. When I was playing Anita <laughs> and when I was younger, I used to play like a three guard because I was like, I was tall. I'm, I'm six three. So in the international game, like that's not super tall. Like I'm a three power forward, small forward vibe. But then like when I went to Notre Dame, I was the tallest player. So I moved more to a center. And then like coming in my rookie year, my second year, I was once again, like the tallest player on the team still. When I tell you, I used to be banging with the big girls, and I'm like, yo, I am little. The Brittany Griners, Sylvia Fowles, Liz Cambridge, like big, big post players, strong post players, and like vets too. So, I mean, I've had my fair share of battles in the post. Like now, thank you, Jesus. We have Tierra McCowan on my team, who is 6'7. We also just drafted Lauren Cox this year. I think she's about around the same height as well. So I get to shift back to more of that power forward and extend myself out and don't have to bang with big girls anymore. But I had my fair share of playing against some OGs and Sylvia Fowles being one of them. <laughs> well, that's funny you touched on you being, first of all, I, it's crazy you threw your height out there like that because I'm, I'm also like 6'3", I'm gonna just say that. <laughs> Every time I'm around each other, I be trying to stay far away. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> Um, do you think that you playing like the three position, like you said, Anita, and so you're probably working on those guard skills. And then now that you're a big and it's like you can go back and forth, do you think that really helps your game? Because I know a lot of people, especially again, I hate to keep bringing up the fact that we're in Canada, but even me, like you said, growing up on my teams, I was always considered the tallest because I've been 6'2 since I was like 10. And my coaches all try to stick me in the post. And luckily enough, I had like the, the, the mindset to think that like, that's not like that tall, like in the NBA. Like I'm not going to be working on drop steps for five years. And then when I go to co college, I'm like, I can't dribble the ball or come off a pick and roll. So it's always important to work on different aspects of your game. And it's funny, it's ironic, because now I actually work on post moves, like mid post moves and stuff like that. Yeah. So, you know, that, do you think that that kind of helps your game out for like the young women out there that realize that, you know, working hard is cool, but you also have to like expand your game on all levels, different positions. Definitely. I think I, some of the skill stuff, like if you don't consi like continue it on a consistent basis, you kind of like lose and pick up. But I think the biggest thing for me was like my thought process and outlook of the game, um, being able to, and having played so many positions, like even now, like any of my teammates always come to me, like I'm talking about my point guards, like, Hey, what are we supposed to do? Cause I know one through five. I know everyone's position and I know what everyone's supposed to do. I think I see the game in a different light. Um, because I learned the game, one, as a team game, and two, I really le learned the details of the game. Uh, I think nowadays young people get so caught up of having a trainer and working out, and they're in the gym by themselves. Like, yes, working out on your individual skills is important, but at the end of the day, you got to remember it's a, it's a five-player game. It's a team game. So you can be great by yourself, but that's all you're going to be. <laughs> like, you, you can't win without your teammates. So – I think it's important, yes, to work on individual skills, but also making sure that you're tying it into the whole game and whole team atmosphere, because um, that's how you win or lose by your team. I think that's really amazing you said that, because me personally, as a combo guard, I'm kind of in a similar situation where I like to learn the play and I like to learn everyone's position. So when I'm on the court, I'm able to kind of direct everybody. And like you said, I have teammates that come to me, like, where do I go on this play? I'm like, you're the five man. Like, <laughs> Know that, but you can see it better. Like you can see it better. Like even in yeah. situations where like someone's coming off a pick and roll, like if I know what you're supposed to be doing, like I know then what the defense is gonna do. I could be two steps ahead because I'm like, if you're doing a pick and roll, if I see them hedge, if I rise up here, I'm gonna be open. But if I didn't know what you were supposed to be doing in that play, I would have no idea. And then I'm reacting. But I can think ahead if I know more and I know what's supposed to be happening. So was that like a conscious effort or was it like for me it was I just always love watching game film, whether it's on myself, or other people. I hate highlight tapes. I don't watch highlight tapes. I watch like full games, whether it's of like NBA players that I think I could take something from their game or weaknesses and strengths or whether it's my game. I just like watching full games because I like to see, like you said, just the different stuff that happens on the court and it really contributes to your, I, your IQ. So is that something that you just were naturally good at or did you work on it? No, it was something that was kind of ingrained in me at a young age. Um, I've been very fortunate to have some amazing coaches. And like I said, I joined the Canada basketball um, program at a young age. So like Mark Walton, Christine Stapleton, Safu Bernard, Allison McNeil, like now Lisa Tomitis with our coach. Like I had some great basketball minds teaching me the game and teaching me the intricate details of the game. Um, and being able to be a part of that program at a young age, I was playing with pros. I was playing on the senior national team at 16. So I got to see 
the leadership and I got to see the experience of what it takes to play at a high level at a young age and watch the game and learn the game that way. I've always said this and, and people think, think I'm crazy. I don't, I don't love basketball. Like some of my teammates, <laughs> I know. Okay. Let me explain though a little bit. Some of my teammates, like they be in the gym for like five hours just shooting hoops. They love to shoot. They love to play basketball. That is not me at all. I love what I can do with basketball and I love where basketball's taking me. I love that I've lived and traveled all over the world. I love that I went to Notre Dame for four years for free. I love that I get paid to put a ball in a hoop. And I love that the relationships and the people that I've met along this, along this journey have like are my heart. <laughs> like they're some of my best friends, mentors and everything. So basketball for me is like the vehicle. So awesome. I don't love the car, <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, I love where it can take me. Yeah. So when I go in the gym, I'm in there for an hour. I know what I need to work on. I know what I need to improve. Like if we're in practice, I know I need to shoot this much. I need to know we need to do this drill and I don't do this and boom, done. I know when I watch film, I know what I'm looking for. I know what I need to try to figure out what I'm trying to improve on. Like for me, it's cut and dry. Be great at your job. Yeah, that's, 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 that's amazing because a lot of people don't have that mindset. They just think that the game, whatever sport, respective sport they play in is the end all be all. So for you to kind of be at this young age and understand that, listen, this has allowed me to get to this place, it's allowed me to meet different people. I think it's, it's something that's really important to have um, just in your backbone. Just know that, you know, basketball can be a tool to network. Like, I agree with you. I've been able to be in, in rooms with some amazing people and continue that relationship so that when I'm done playing basketball, I'm able to still have a life. I think that's something that people don't understand either is that basketball is not a golf. Like, we can't play until we're like, like old. <laughs> after the majority of us retire in our 30s or, you know, some people who are fortunate enough, like Vince Carter, to play until they're 40, which I personally don't want to do. Like, yeah. We still have a whole life to live after, like a whole whatever, 50, 60 plus years of life to live after that. So I think it's very imperative that you take advantage of the opportunities, whether it's getting an education and going to school, whether it's like you said, me and different people, um, and just allow basketball to be the vehicle, like you said. So that's really cool. So I'm wondering. Yeah, also like, I think most of the time, female athletes, like women's basketball players have this mentality. Like I'm not super, like I'm not this super special <laughs> person. Um, and it's unfortunate why we have this mentality. It's because like the opportunity to be successful for an extended period of time at this level is, is difficult. I mean, yes, you can play overseas. Yes, there's many leagues that you can play overseas, but that's also being away from your family. That's not being at home. And how long can you really do that? Or do you want to do that is a question. I mean, if you play in the WMA, there's 12 teams, 12 players on each team. There's only 144 jobs. So like, I know if I'm not great at my job right now, there's, Somebody else ready. Yeah. 100 players I want to take my job that could take my job that are skilled enough and good enough to play in the WBA, but there's not opportunity. So um, I think as women's basketball players, we have to prepare for plan B, plan C, or what happens or what happens next. Because um, like we were talking about again, injury is the worst part of the game. Like your job could be over tomorrow, like God forbid, but that's the way it goes in athletics. Okay, so last question about kind of like the basketball aspect before I get into it. I'm wearing a Team Canada hoodie, so we're going to talk about you playing Team Canada, and then we're going to and play, put on notice. Um, you just touched on you being a professional basketball player. You guys play in the W, and then you also play overseas. For me, I couldn't imagine, because it's like year-round basketball, you don't really get an opportunity to kind of rest, see family, live life, like, and things of that nature. However, you do get to travel. You do get to meet new people and things, but I understand it's a grind, especially because, you know, women, you guys are so undervalued um, when it comes to, like, what you guys do. Like, I'm, like I said, I know Asia Wilson, and she's an advocate for you guys being, you know, paid more and just better accommodations when it comes to how you guys traveled before COVID um, and things of that nature. So just talk about how tough it is for you to be in the W and then go straight to overseas, and then it's, like, just clockwork. Yeah, it literally, it, it is a grind. It's the definition of a grind because we play year-round basketball. So, and on top of that, you can add, like, national teams. So, on some years I play on, well, most years I play on three teams a year. So, I'm playing in the summer in the WNBA, and then typically in the summer and the fall, I'm playing with a national team as well on top of that, and then you go overseas. So, I've actually, 
um, modified, I guess, my overseas commitments and signing contracts a little bit because I know what works for me and what doesn't work for me. I mean, my first year or so, like even coming after off of that ACL injury, I played the WNBA summer. Um, and I also played um, some Team Canada in there. That would have been 2015. So we were playing Pan Am games um, and qualifiers at that point. And then I went overseas and I played in Italy. So it was a lot on my body. And I mean, if you know anything about like European seasons are long too on top of that. So I knew that that's something I couldn't do. So the last couple of years I played in Asia because they had shorter seasons. Um, played in um, South Korea a couple of years. I played in China. And then even this past year, um, when I didn't play in Asia, I didn't get a contract in Asia, I stayed home to one, like you said, rest, maybe have a little bit of a life uh, outside of basketball. And then I signed a short-term contract where I went to uh, France to replace a player for a couple months that was injured. It was only supposed to be um, for a month while she was out, and then it ended up being extended, so I stayed another month. Um, or two months, I don't remember. <laughs> but I was only there for a couple months, and then I came back and started training again. And it's like, it's nonstop cycle of basketball. But I mean, our time span and our window of being athletes is short, right? So you kind of got to make the best of it. Yeah, I swear you got to get the time to just chill and just rest and just have like an off season and vacate and just be a woman. It's just, it's tough. Like I admire you guys for what you guys do. I think it's incredible. And then even the whole, like, you don't have to get into it, but I, I, I assume you probably want a family and just having to like balance, like when, do I, am I able to have kids right now with like, that's going to affect my career. So I think, um, you know, all those things for young women out there who are looking up and watching you, it's just that something you have to like have in the back of your head, just like to understand just the, the aspect of balancing certain things. So and it's like, like, like even in the situation of being in the bubble, like this is when I say like women, in the WNBA, like if people tell their stories and people really look at the women that are here, like, they're incredible like literal super women we have mothers here that have their children here in the middle of a pandemic in the middle of a bubble one of the players her son was starting kindergarten e-learning like the day before a game like and still goes and plays at the highest level in the world mm-hmm. like you can be mothers a couple own businesses i mean i'm in real estate like you know what i mean like people like we do this <laughs> and it's so multi-leveled and like honestly I think that's what always motivates me and gives me this sense of like energy to continue going it's like I look around me and my peers and I'm like like these are some dope women I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> I always love the opportunity whenever my name is called you know I'm there to yeah. play I have the opportunity to put on a jersey and represent our country um, I'm very patriotic. I know you are as well. You've played in, if I'm not mistaken, two Olympics. Yep, London and Rio. It's incredible, like incredible. I, I even just was thrilled to qu- help qualify for the FIBA World Cup and, and stuff like that. So just talk about your experience. For me, playing for Team Canada means the world because I can play with, you know, the brothers that I grew up playing with or guys that I looked up to that are older than me that, you know, I can get advice from and support. And then just also ushering the younger generation and just trying to put basketball on that, I mean, Canada on that basketball pedestal because we have talent. We've had talent for a long time. And I'm just a matter of putting the world on notice again, no pun intended. But I love the fact that we get to travel. I love the camaraderie. You know, you go to school, you go to, uh, you, you play on different teams and you see your, your, well, my teammates from, from Team Canada and it's always like a cool feeling. So what does it mean when you put the, the, the Canadian jersey on for you? And talk about playing in the Olympics, like that's huge. Yeah, I, it means the world to me. Like to know that every time I get to put on a jersey that says Canada, like I represent so much more than myself. Like, it, it, and it's never about like the name on the back. Like, yes, I represent my family, but having Canada on my chest, like represents my family and beyond. Like it's, it's, I get to represent so many different people from so many different walks of life. And I think that's what gives me so much inspiration. Um, and anytime that I'm, asked I always come um I missed a couple years of course with injury but um, it is an honor it is a privilege to be able to put on that jersey and that is something that is so ingrained in our women's team it's like you can see I mean Kim Goche has been on the team for yeah you guys have that. Like, a long time Kim I love you I'm gonna say a long time okay she's been on the team for a long time like I said I've been on the team since I was 16 so almost like 10 years now um and it is something that I will never take lightly. I will never take lightly. Um, And just to know that 
we are giving girls dreams. Anytime, like we get the, when we're on the, especially on Olympic years is the only time we really get on TV in Canada with the national team, which also needs to change. That's a whole different conversation. But like, we are giving girls the vision to be able to see what they can be. Like, like we talked about the WNBA not being on team on TV, our national team not being on TV. How do you expect young girls to be able to be, I want to be a women's basketball player. I want to play basketball when I grow up. If all they see is the NBA, all they see is men, all they see is the NCAA. How do you expect them to dream and to envision themselves in those opportunities if they cannot see them? So for me, anytime I put that on, I take it with the most pride because I know that when I was at that age, I just, I wanted someone to look up to. And I was really fortunate, like I said, to be a part of the Canada basketball program at a young age because they gave me firsthand role models, like people to aspire to be. So now they're my teammates and my fellow teammates, but at that age, they were my heroes. They were who I dreamt to be like. Um, And now you're a whole bunch of people's heroes. (laughs) And now I'm old. (laughs) And now I'm on the vet side. I mean, I'm I'm still still a a young vet in a sense, but my role has changed so much with that team. And to see the evolution of the team is amazing. Like you said, I've been to two Olympics, but I remember – when we first started, it, w- it wasn't that. It was dreams of qualifying. Now it's dreams of medals. And I don't even say dreams, expectations. Yeah. Like that's, that's, you can see the development of the game in Canada and our national team program is like, they're expectations now. Yeah. So of course, like preparing now for next year when Tokyo will be, Tokyo 2021 <laughs> will be next year. But like, it's the goal to be on the pedestal. It's the goal to like win a medal. We want to see you there. I believe you will be there. Okay, well, that was great. This is the end of regulation. Overtime. Um, we're going to play put on notice. Um, put on notice. I'm just going to put 24 seconds on the shot clock. Uh-oh. Twitter or Instagram? Instagram. Pasta or sushi? Okay. You said so Canadian with pasta. It's pasta in America. But sushi. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, the ball without a bounce. Hold on. <laughs> okay, see the ball without a bounce. Okay. Side note, you know how much I get made fun of for certain words I say. It passes one of them, so now it's because yeah. they say pasta. In That's all. They be thinking I'm saying pasta. I'm like, no. Pasta. What are the other ones? Like when I say cutlery, they're all like, it's silverware. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Pineapples on pizza or no? Yes or no? Yes. Mhm. Mhm. Hard liquor or wine? Wine. Wine. So Sue Bird or Don Staley? Ooh, tough. Yeah, how are you gonna put Sue? She's current. I mean Don Staley because she's an OG. <laughs> okay, Kobe's or Retro Jordans? Ooh, tough. Kobe's. <laughs> okay, Ashanti or Alicia Keys? I mean Alicia Keys. Oh. Yeah, I mean I love Ashanti, but like I think Alicia Keys has more of like a track record. Okay, that's it. Yeah. So now I always give you opportunity to just talk about whatever you want to talk about. Put the world on notice. I know you said you had some things that you wanted to touch on, so now would be the time to just let us know what you were going through, thinking about. Yeah, uh, this summer has been a heavy summer in general, and part of our goal, I mean, as a collective WNBA, but also like with my team, we wanted to make sure that even though we we're physically coming into the bubble, we were still able to make an impact in our community. So we've actually been doing a couple different social injustice um, initiatives and one of them being a shoe auction. So uh, coming up in our games, while will actually be wearing um, a pair of custom sneakers and my teammates have been wearing them all season. So we actually on the feverbasketball.com slash fever for change, you can bid on all the shoes. So they'll be up there for auction and the proceeds will go to our fever for change fund, um, which we're trying to help different non-for-profit organizations within Indiana, but actually all over um, to try to make a difference in helping bring uh, opportunity and money finances to groups that are making a change in our community. Um, So go bet on my shoes, bet on my teammates shoes. I can actually show you. SQ Customs actually designed them. They're kind of dope, but so wow. yeah, right. So of course it says vote, like powerful message, use your voice. Um, and then you got the fist on it. 
Um, this one says Black Lives Matter. Couple words that really are who I am. Love, grit, and faith. That's amazing. And then a little shout out to my Irish, my Notre Dame, four uh, leaves over. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, you can bid on these online. They'll be up for auction till October. Um, or you can bid on some of my teammates' ones. They got some cool. One of my teammates has some boondocks ones. Like, it's, it's pretty dope. So check cool. it out. Help us make a difference. All right, thank you. So I appreciate you being on my show, someone that I've known for quite some time. And, um, you know, I appreciate as, you as a, as a human as well as a basketball player. Someone who has two baby sisters, one is eight, one's turning six in a couple of weeks. Uh, they love basketball, and you're one of the people that I'm like, Yo, you need to watch this game. Like, look, I know her. And they don't believe it. So now that we do <laughs> anymore, I can actually show them, like, listen, I actually know Natalie. So <laughs> I'm not my show. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. And, I mean, good luck. Get healthy. Get better. And, um, yeah, thanks for spreading the love of women's basketball and me and my crew. <laughs>